Hello everyone, nice to see so many faces here. Um, so I know this is the 2 p.m. talk, so <laughs> I have a lot of images and pie charts, so hopefully we will all <laughs> stay awake. Um, my name is Laura, I work with Collabra, and today I would like to share with you um, some of the struggles and challenges of growing and maintaining a laboratory for upstream testing. Um, so first of all, we're going to take a virtual tour of the Collabora Lab Lab. We're going to see what devices are inside, how it is set up, and we're going to judge a little bit our cable management. Um, next, we are going to discuss how um, laboratory are uh, relevant for testing um, upstream code, uh, especially relevant for op open source projects. And we're also going to see which projects are currently uh, leveraging the Collabora Lab Lab. Um, next, we're going to see, um, share some of our daily headaches, so what can go wrong in the lab, and also what are the challenges of adding more and more devices. Uh, we're going to also discuss maintenance and monitoring, and a little bit of performance tracking, and finally, we're going to see what's next. Um, so, um, Collabor is maintaining a laboratory, a lava laboratory in uh, Cambridge, in the UK. Um, our goal building this lab was to have an ecosystem of devices that open source projects could use for automated testing. Uh, so basically we wanted to be a big test bed for open source projects. Um, it runs Lava, so the linear automation and validation architecture for uh, controlling all the devices and running tests on them. So um, as of August, we had like 158 devices of 32 different types. Actually, shame on me for not updating this slide because uh, in the past few days we uh, added like 10 or more devices. Um, these devices are spread across uh, 15 different racks. Each rack is controlled by its own server. And of course, on top of all these devices, we have all the hardware infrastructure to control them. Uh, so network switches, power supplies, USB hubs, tons and tons of cables. Um, this is the architecture distribution as of uh, last month. So um, at the moment, the bulk of the tests that run in the Collabora Lava Lab are, um, are targeting x86-64 and ARM64 platforms. So that's why we have so many of them. Um, and as of the device distribution, um, the majority of devices that we currently have are Chromebooks. Uh, we also have some uh, embedded SPC and also some uh, QM instances, that's the yellow uh, thing here. And yeah, so this is um, about the distribution that we have at the moment. Um, this is the growth that uh, our lab had in the past few years. This goes back uh, to April 2020. So we, we had like 50 devices more or less and we ended up with 100 more. Um, you can also see that every time we add a new device type, we add more than one um, device of that type in the lab. So this is to assure a little bit of de um, device redundancy. Uh, here you can see uh, what it actually looks like. These are some of the uh, latest racks that we have set up. Uh, yeah, the last one is a little bit empty, but it has been filled up by now. Um, yeah, I mentioned cable management just because I, I knew that this looked good in this picture. Um, yeah, the real important thing apart from cable management is that everything is labeled. Um, so it happens quite a lot of times that we need to unplug and replug stuff. <laughs> so if there's a label there, it's going to be easier. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, our laboratory lab, uh, runs LAVA. Uh, LAVA is a CI system to deploy operating systems to both physical and virtual devices. So it handles the power control, it, it handles the um, access to the serial consoles, and it also, of course, schedules the test uh, jobs on the devices. So examples of tests that you can do in LAVA is, for example, checking if your um, kernel changes um, boot correctly on all, on all different platforms, or um, you can also test user space changes against uh, different kernel versions. Um, Lava is designed for validation during development. So the main idea is that developers should uh, push their changes to a development branch. The development branch then gets tested and results are fed back to the developer uh, so that you can check that uh, your changes um, do not introduce any regression on different um, devices and also that there's no other side effect. 
Uh, it has also a very scalable scheduler. Uh, it can run dozens of tests every day across the same instance. Um, so yeah, it's really good for uh, adding more and more devices. Um, as I said, like, um, Lava helps um, with um, automating the um, boot and deploy phases of the boot process, but it's not um, a complete CI solution. In order to close the CI loop, you will need to figure out a way to um, uh, automatically build your binaries and artifacts, uh, actually submitting these test jobs to Lava, and finally uh, getting back the results um, in a formatted way uh, to the developer. You cannot really expect developers to go and check out the uh, Lava dashboard and see how a test job does. It's much better if results get formatted, um, well formatted and they're sent back automatically over email, for example. Um, so let's see what are the base requirements for a device to be enabled in Lava. Um, if, for example, we want to um, run an NFS test, so a test that uh, boots a system over NFS, we're going to power on the device. The device will start one or more bootloaders. We're going to need to stop the bootloader process at some point. Um, we're going to need to uh, load a kernel image, a device tree if that's needed, um, a RAM disk image. Then we are going to need um, to set up the command line, any command line options that might be needed for this test. And we're going to then kick the boot, uh, let the device run again. Uh, the device, of course, will run the kernel, load the init run disk, uh, mount the root fast. And once we, can, once we get to the uh, login prompt, we're going to log into the system and run whatever, the whatever script with the test we want to run. Finally, we're gonna, be, we're gonna um, power off the device. So in order for devices to work in Lava, we need to fulfill some base requirements. Uh, so the device will need to be able to turn on and off remotely. Uh, we will need access to a re reliable text output console, for example, a serial console. And we're also gonna be, um, we're gonna need to uh, be able to load a kernel device tree and whatever we need remotely. So, um, as for the Lava point of view, um, the device configuration consists of a series of uh, Jinja2 and YAML files. Um, so you have um, the device type template, which outlines the requirements to boot the device. So um, things that go in the device type template are, for example, um, the type of bootloader the device runs and extra command line options that may be needed. Then we have the device dictionary, which is a template with all the device specific commands go. So for example, which command is needed for powering on, on and off the device or accessing the serial console and also other uh, device specific characteristics such as the IP address if needed. And then the last piece of configuration is the health check, which is a special kind of test job uh, that uh, is used to uh, check that the device is functional so it boots, uh, deploys and boots a test image and just checks that the device works correctly. Um, this is a test that is supposed to be run on a regular basis. Um, the, the frequency of this job can be configured in Lava. Um, what we usually do in our lab is uh, running a health check on every kind of device uh, that we have every day to make sure that all devices are stable. So uh, just to give a little bit of context, this is a, uh, I took some bits and pieces from a kernel CI job that uh, ran in our lab recently, um, just to understand how a test job in Lava is uh, structured. So uh, you have a set of um, information describing the um, type of test that we're running. So in this case, we're targeting one Chromebook. Um, then we have a job name defined, so uh, this is a really long one actually, but uh, it's really descriptive. Uh, we set up also the priority and every timeout, so for example in this case we're going to say that the power off action should not take more than 30 seconds and the, the overall job should not take more than 10 minutes. And also we're saying that this job um, should not stay in the queue uh, for more than two days, then it gets cancelled automatically. Uh, this is a publicly visible job, and in this case, we're also defining some extra cons uh, command line options for this test. So um, every Lava test job has three actions. Uh, we have the deploy action, the boot action, and the test action. Here you can see the deploy one. Um, 
Here we're basically defining where Lava should uh, look for uh, the device tree blob, the kernel image, the modules archive, the RAM disk as well. And yeah, we, we are also saying that all these images will be loaded over TFTP. Next step, the boot action. Um, here we are defining the type of job that we are going to run. So this is a um, very a simpler job which does not um, boot the system over NFS, but it just uses a RAM disk. Um, the method is depth charge just because this is a Chromebook, so it runs depth charge as a bootloader. Uh, here we are also defining the prompt string uh, that Lava will look for in order to understand when the boot uh, process is finished and the device is ready to uh, run our test script. We're also overriding the full timeout, saying that this uh, boot action should not take more than five minutes. Um, finally, there's the test action. Actually, this test has uh, two test actions. I just took one because it's, uh, they're pretty similar. Uh, so this um, example shows an inline test. So pretty much every, everything is defined inside the YAML file describing this test job. You can also have uh, test job definitions uh, stored in a separate repository and have Lava fetch them. Um, in this case, we have like um, a lot of uh, properties describing the test, so a name for it, the type of uh, operating system it runs, and yeah, metadata in general. And then we have the um, steps for the actual test jobs. Uh, which in this case, we're just running a uh, DMESC um, script, which just checks the uh, kernel log for uh, errors. So basically this whole test job will fail if, um, if any error in message is detected in the kernel log. So uh, this is um, basically what a job uh, is, how a job is structured, uh, but how can we actually submit any job in Lava? We have a few options. These are just some examples. Um, you can use the API directly. Uh, Lava provides two API, the XML RPC one and the REST API. You can also use a Python tree command line, which is um, Lavacly, and uh, it allows to interact with all the Lava objects. So uh, you can easily uh, push device type templates or dictionary or submit jobs. It's really useful during development where we need, uh, where we are still defining, for example, uh, the device dictionary. Uh, we can easily push it to the device and just quickly test if it works. Uh, another thing that we uh, use a lot is the Lava GitLab runner. Uh, it serves as a bridge between GitLab and Lava. Uh, so it allows to submit uh, a job monitor it and retrieve the results as uh, job artifacts. Um, so you can set up like um, pipelines in GitLab to have uh, jobs scheduled automatically uh, based on uh, whenever uh, new changes are pushed to a certain branch or whenever a merge request is open. Oh yeah, it uses the Lava API, uh, which is uh, in turn uses the Lava REST API. So, uh, what's the process that we use to add a new device in our lab? First of all, we prepare the device to uh, run uh, tests. This usually includes refreshing the firmware in some cases, or um, enabling some debugging function if we're, we, for example, need to access a serial console. Uh, once the device is uh, ready, uh, we prepare the, the Lava device configuration, so we write the uh, device type template, the dictionary, and the health check. And finally, we, all, uh, we add also, of course, the network configuration for it. Uh, next, before even uh, thinking of installing the device in the lab, we do a lot of stress testing. So for every new device type that we add in our lab, we run about uh, 1,000 tests, uh, 1,000 health checks on it, um, just to check that the device is stable enough to be moved to production. And finally, when the device is ready, we just install it in the racks. And if the um, device type that we define is a new one, we just kind of send it upstream. So um, I wanted to give you an example of how a device can be prepared. Um, the process for Chromebooks is kind of, uh, it's very different from the uh, standard procedure that you will have for um, a single board computer. So I just to, to show you this one, uh, as we have so many Chromebooks in our lab. So um, 
Capabilities such as powering on and off the device and accessing the serial consoles on Chromebooks are locked by default. Um, these capabilities are also part of what's called the closed case debugging. So in order to unlock the, these capabilities and being able to uh, power on and off the device remotely, for example, uh, we need to unlock these capabilities. Uh, these are implemented by uh, uh, the CR50 firmware, which runs inside one of the chips that are inside of Chromebooks. So here you can see we have the um, AP, the application processor, which is the main processor that runs Chrome OS inside a Chromebook. Then we have the embedded controller, which um, takes care of the power sensors and uh, keyboard interaction as well. And then finally, we have this Google security chip which runs the uh, firmware implementing CCD. So uh, in order to unlock the capabilities, as I said, we need to interact uh, with the uh, Google security chip. Uh, for Chromebooks, this happens through a special kind of cable, a USB-C cable, which is called the SUSE-Q cable. Uh, what it does is basically it instructs the CR50 to enter debug mode and it exposes a console. From that console, we can unlock the capabilities that we need for this device. Uh, finally, the actual software tools that we use to uh, power on and off the device and find access uh, to the um, serial consoles for all the different chips is the HDC tools, which are um, maintained by Google and developed by Google. So uh, with the SUSE Q cable and these software tools, uh, we are able to fulfill two of these requirements. So we're able to turn on and off the power remotely and also uh, access the serial console. Uh, we still need to find a way to uh, boot an arbitrary kernel DTB and in it uh, run this combination. Um, so in order to do that, uh, we need to look quickly at what runs in a Chromebook out of the box. So um, you have Coreboot, which is the main system firmware, which will load um, depth chart as a payload. Um, depth chart is the Chrome OS bootloader, and that, of course, will in turn load uh, Chrome OS. So what we need to do to be able to load whatever kernel image we want is we need to um, stop at the depth chart phase, somehow drop into a um, bootloader prompt and execute our commands. So what we usually do is uh, we take Chrome OS out of the picture, basically, and we just uh, build and flash uh, a new version of depth chart, which has support for the command line uh, interface and also the TFTP um, protocol. So once we have that, we are able to stop the depth chart fails and just uh, load whatever we want. So yeah, this is the just a summary of uh, the things that I just um, Sad. Uh, so with these tools, we are able to fulfill all these requirements and the Chromebook is uh, pretty much ready to run tests uh, in Lava. Uh, so as I said, once the uh, device uh, is prepared, uh, we need to uh, do some stress testing. And we, in, the, in Collabora Lava Lab, we have two different instances. One is the staging instance and one is the production instance. So in the staging instance is the place where we move devices uh, when are, they are being prepared. So once the device is ready, we just move it to staging and run uh, a lot of health checks on it, just, uh, just see that it's stable enough. Uh, staging is also the place where we test uh, every uh, Lava patch uh, before upstreaming it. So if we have changed the Lava code base, we just push our changes to the staging instance first. And this is kept closes, uh, this is kept uh, updated to stay as close as possible to the upstream lava. And yeah, this is also where um, we move the devices. So if we, ha if we have a faulty device in production, we just move it back to the staging instance and we run all kind of tests on them before moving, moving them back. In the production instance, we only have production ready devices. So it's really important that these are uh, continuously monitor to make sure that they're, they're in good health and they're function, functioning as expected. So uh, we have seen a little bit how the uh, lab is set up and what kind of devices we have inside, but what do we actually use it for? Uh, so 
at the moment, we have two big open source projects that are uh, leveraging the Collabora Lava Lab, among other labs as well. And these are Kernel CI and Meso CI, which are currently um, submitting hundreds of, um, hundreds of test jobs every day. Uh, this is really important, like having a lab is really, really important for these kind of projects, especially large scale projects, because it allows to test the code on a lot of different platforms in a standardized way. It also helps finding regressions and identifying the root cause, for example, through um, automated bisection. Uh, it improves the overall main long term main maintenance and um, code quality and it also caps, helps catch uh, mistakes earlier. So if you push a patch that just causes a kernel loops on, dif different, on a different uh, device step, uh, that you, the one that you use for your local tests, uh, with the lab you're able to, to track down the, the error and find the, the, the cause of the issue. So uh, yet more pie charts. Um, here you can see how many jobs uh, were run throughout August by kernel CI only. Uh, it is quite of, um, it is well distributed between the devices that we have at the moment. Uh, as you probably know, kernel CI is a project uh, focused on mainline Linux kernel continuous testing. It's not all, all it's not only uh, boot tests, so it just, it's not limited to just checking that a device boots correctly. You also have all kinds of baseline tests to check for basic functionalities. You also have subsystem tests, such as lib camera compliance tests and V4L2 compliance tests. And you also have uh, some user space tests, such so as uh, the TAST tests, which are for the Chrome OS user space. The other uh, open, open source project that is currently leveraging in Collabora Lava Lab is Mesa CI. Uh, Mesa CI is focused on Mesa pre-merge pre conformance tests and uh, post-merge automated performance tracking. Uh, here you can see a list of all the APIs and drivers that are currently covered. Uh, they are quite a lot and the list keeps growing and growing. Uh, here, yeah, uh, the Mesa CI jobs targets more uh, of the x86-64 platform, so it's uh, the majority of tests are running on that platforms. So with so many uh, jobs running every day in our lab, a lot of things can go wrong. Um, I'm a software developer, so of course I'm going to blame the hardware first. Um, you have a lot of uh, hardware degradation issues, so you may have faulty cables, you may have batteries dying or power supplies that are not charging the batteries properly, or even SD cards getting degraded. Uh, of course, you have network issues from time to time, and these are especially critical because they can affect both, both the devices in the lab and also the um, lava servers. Uh, so they need to be addressed as quickly as possible. Um, then you have all kinds of issues that are related to, the, um, to how the devices are set up in the racks. So from time to time, you may need to move a device from one rack to another, or, to, or you may need to unplug cables. In the process, it's only natural that sometimes cables just get um, knocked out of position or the lid of the device gets a little bit too close, uh, or you may have also overeating because the devices are too close to each other. Um, and finally, you also have some uh, firmware bugs, of course, uh, bugs on the firmware that is uh, running on the devices, and also bugs on the firmware that it's running on the hardware debug uh, interfaces that you use. Um, so it's only normal that all of these uh, problems happen, uh, but they need to be addressed as quickly and as uh, effective, effectively as possible uh, in order not to um, block, uh, like not to interact with the test results and also potentially block merge requests. So we saw that, for example, Mesa CI uses um, the, the test results for uh, pre-merge conformance. So if a merge request from a user gets blocked, we need to make sure that uh, the reason for that uh, is that because the changes introduced uh, make, make the test fail and not because the infrastructure is not working as expected. 
So um, a lot of errors are automatically detected by Lava and marked as infrastructure errors. Um, here we can see an example of it. This is a Chromebook where during the bootloader phase, uh, the Ethernet interface had some problems and we were not able to reach the uh, bootloader prompt. So Lava in this case will, um, the, the action taking care of loading the kernel image will time out and an infrastructure error will be raised automatically. Uh, also, every time an infrastructure error is raised by Lava, um, a health check is scheduled on the same device right afterwards. So if this, for example, were just a temporary network glitch, uh, the subsequent health check will pass and the device will stay online. But if this problem is actually a, a real problem, the, the health check will fail right afterwards and the device will be taken offline automatically. So for all the common issues that cannot be detected automatically by Lava, uh, you may want to add um, a test in the health check. So for example, if you need to check for the battery capacity of the device and making sure that the battery is in good health, that's um, a good example of a test that can fit inside a health check. So some of the things that we have learned in all of these projects is that the um, monitoring is really, really important um, to make sure that the, um, the, any issue is addressed quickly and also that devices get replaced uh, when they're not functioning correctly. So Lava provides uh, quite a lot of APIs to uh, detect events and status changes in the devices. So you can build all, of kind, all kind of metrics on top of it to just make monitor the overall status of the devices and also to send notification when the devices go offline. It's really important also that uh, you write uh, health checks that are robust enough to uh, detect animal functioning so that the devices are taken offline right away and they, we don't need to manually intervene on that. Um, yeah, so also the, um, it's also really important to monitor the uh, infrastructure errors. That is especially useful to spot an issue with the racks or with a specific rack or with the way a specific device is set up inside the lab. And finally, it's really important to um, provide enough device redundancy so that all the pipelines from the projects are fed and also so that the side effects of one device going down are not too um, harsh. So uh, adding more and more devices, of course, mean you're gonna need more space. You're gonna need a lot more hardware equipment and also a lot of maintenance is required. This is just to make sure that all the devices are um, kept online and if they go offline, uh, we need to make sure that they uh, return back online uh, in a very quick way. So of course, the more devices you have, the more hard it is uh, to, to track the status of all these devices. And finally, having more devices mean, usually means having more test coverage. So more tests are running and they need to be tracked. Each, um, the, the job log for each task test running is logged in the Lava database. So more devices mean more tests and more tests mean more um, load on the Lava's DB. DB. Uh, this can also have, of course, an impact on your monitoring processes. So um, some of the recent achievements that we have, uh, we added um, quite a lot of statistics to monitor um, how this, the servers running Lava are doing. And also we added some statistics on the database usage. Um, with this analysis, we were able to identify, for example, that Lava was spending quite a lot of time on a API response pagination. So that gave us um, a good opportunity to um, improve some of the SQL qu queries and also to uh, upstream some optimization on the pagination. Uh, we also have now a dummy load generator. Um, this is just to emulate high uh, database load uh, scenarios and um, 
spot any possible um, lava regression, lava performance regression when we do an update. So these are uh, the next steps. So we're looking forward to uh, keep adding more and more devices to increase the overall uh, lab capacity and also cover uh, more and more platform from different vendors. Uh, in this process of adding more and more devices, we will of course keep improving our infrastructure and our monitoring tools. Uh, this also means um, adding more automation on the process of recovering devices that go offline and also automating uh, all those operations that are currently manually uh, done, such as replugging cables. Uh, so while adding more and more devices, we have more opportunities of introducing more automation and reducing the manual operations. Uh, we, of course, uh, we're looking forward to keep um, reporting issues and sending more patches to upstream. And adding more devices, we uh, also look forward to adding more tests, so increase the test coverage. I think that's it. I should have time for some questions. Uh, uh, not really, like it's not what Lava does, it's more uh, maybe what LabGrid does. Oh, sorry, yeah, uh, in, the question is if there's any uh, interactive mode to debug the boards in Lava. Um, and the answer is not as, as far as I know. Uh, this is not like the, uh, the scope of Lava, it's just for automated tests. So developers cannot really uh, access the boards inside. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, sure. Are you limited to the number of, uh, I guess, nodes on connected to your server uh, for console output to the number of USB ports on your own? Uh, yeah, we, I mean, uh, it really depends on the machines that you use to uh, run Lava on. Uh, we uh, have quite a lot of USB hubs just to add more and more ports, if that's the question. Yeah, that's not what I think I was getting. Any <laughs> other question? I saw the reporting could detect infrastructure failure. Does it do anything else other than that? Like, uh, can it detect, like, hey, this is probably a, like, a, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but, like, the specific failures of a board? Uh, so besides the type of exceptions that is raised by Lava, so, for example, the infrastructure error, you also get um, a different message uh, based on the type of error that occurred. So Lava has... Um, defines quite a lot of uh, different exceptions. So based on when an error occurs during the boot process, for example, and also based on the symptoms, it will raise a different exception. So you have a few uh, base exception types, but you also get like a nice um, message describing the error. Of course, this is not catching all of the possible errors that you may have. Uh, in general, it's way easier to detect in an automated way messages that manifest with a clear error message. Uh, but if, for example, you have, um, you stop getting output from the console uh, in the middle of the kernel process, uh, it's much harder to uh, automatically detect if it's just the kernel hanging or if, for example, the serial cable just got disconnected uh, out of the blue. So you have uh, some flexibility where you're not going to be able to catch every single possible error. Yeah. Uh, do you have information about like your power controllers and your USB hubs, that, like the, the equipment that surrounds your lab? Or uh, we track them um, internally, like we, we are tracking uh, which USB hubs and which type of USB hubs we have on every other server. Uh, but uh, no, I don't think we monitor like the performances or no, anything. I was wondering if like you could share what like power controllers you're using and, and 
Uh, I don't have uh, information at the moment, okay. uh, but I, I can add maybe a slide with some references. Uh, I don't think you have um, a way to do that from uh, inside Lava. So Lava will just export uh, the results in various formats, but you will need to use uh, some, some kind of other process external uh, to just uh, fetch the results and send them. Uh, like kernel CI, for example, sends emails to the developers whenever um, something breaks, basically, or there's been a, any kind of regression. Um, but that needs to be figured out outside. So that's the reason why Lava is not a full uh, CI system. Uh, you will need to have another tool external to that. Yep. Uh, so at the moment, I'm working more on the uh, software enablement of the Chromebooks and the other devices in the lab. We have two people uh, working on site. So physically accessing all the devices and unplugging cables when it's needed. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, um, you said uh, squad on the two point zero to uh, aggregate and uh, the different base and. Uh, the Which two? Sorry. The squad. I don't squad. think so. I'm looking on other members of the team, but I don't think so. <laughs> we'll check it out though. So there's still five minutes. I see if there's any other question. Uh, similar question. Are you guys sending any results to KCIDB? I, I am right. not sure, <laughs> actually, still well, looking at the. Yeah, it's not lab itself, right? It's yeah. Well, yeah, I think you have to, well, I'm sure you have to enable something to send the report to the It's not allowed on that side, it doesn't, right? It's allowed to use it, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if the kernel CI uh, pipeline currently uses it. I would assume so, because it's all integrated, but I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure he has got the stuff going. Well, yeah, know. probably. <laughs> All right, and thank you so much.